In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the past number of decades, there's been a real hostility towards family life, and in particular, towards the role of fathers. You know, when we think about it, there's been a cartoon uh, on television for 31 years where the father is kind of portrayed as a lovable kind of buffoon, doesn't really know what's going on. Uh, I don't think I've seen it in 30 years, uh, but it's still on the air, and I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. But that portrayal in that cartoon is not unique. In general, fathers are often portrayed in not a positive light in our society, in our movies. And this has been going on for decades where, you know, they're just, they might be the lovable buffoon, but they're not really, you know, in charge or, you know, not really know what's going on. And this is a soft hostility against the role of fatherhood uh, in particular and, and Christian family life in general. You know, we don't want to go to the other extreme, though. You know, St. Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, when he talks about uh, husbands and wives, he talks to them. He says, be subject to one another as you are subject in Christ. So there's a mutual submission there between husband and wife. And then he goes on to explain uh, the, uh, the, the different roles about how the husband is the head of the family. And his headship is similar to the headship of Christ. So the husband is not a dictator. But there is a different roles there, but he is the head of the family. And one of the things, just like Christ, Christ sacrifices himself for the church. So the husband, the father, sacrifices himself for the family. Now, last year, 2020, was the 150th anniversary of the proclamation of St. Joseph as the patron of the Universal Church. And we are now in the midst of the year of St. Joseph where uh, there were special indulgence prayers uh, to St. Joseph for during this, during this uh, time. And devotion to St. Joseph is a more recent phenomenon in the church. Really in the past 200 years has it really picked up, maybe around the time of the Reformation, but then in the past 200 years, uh, and then of course 150 years ago, it really began to pick up steam because we understand St. Joseph and his degree of sanctity in reference to Our Lady, because he is the head of the Holy Family, and so he must be in a pretty elevated spiritual state, just like we look at Our Lady and we understand her spiritual state in reference to Christ. And so we look at St. Joseph, and if he's the head of the Holy Family, has a true headship over Our Lady and the child Jesus, he must be in an, or he must have been in his life in an extremely high spiritual state. The great theologian, uh, Reginald, Father Reginald Marie Garibou Lagrange, he's written a number of books. He was the, basically the last of the neo Thomist theologians in Rome before the Second Vatican Council. He writes about St. Joseph and he says, uh, this was in the 50s, uh, late 50s, early 60s, he says that the general consensus among Josephologists, and a Josephologist is a theologian who specializes in St. Joseph, he says the general consensus is that at least from the time of the marriage between Our Lady and St. Joseph, that St. Joseph did not commit any sin, no venial sins at all. And that's at least from that time. Probably from before then, because he would have, you know, he would reach that high spiritual state. You know, God offers the graces, but then we say yes to them. So it's, it's two ways. So he developed that high spiritual state, of course, through the grace of God. And then he achieved that high spiritual state through the grace of God. So that then he was then worthy to uh, marry Our Lady. And I think everybody knows the, the pious tradition that the staff flowered, and this is how the uh, priest knew that this was the man set aside for Our Lady. And so, because he has a true spiritual headship over Our Lady and Christ, Christ is true God and true man, but St. Joseph being the head of the Holy Family would have had a true headship over it. And we see this 
in the, in the scriptures. The angel is the one who tells him to go to Egypt and then tells him it's okay to return. He has a true headship. But not only that, and this is where, this is a more contemporary thing, and when I say contemporary, the past 150 years, 200 years, that we know how children develop. That little children need a father. And we see this oftentimes in a, in a negative example where maybe something happened, there's a divorce or a death or something, and uh, there might be a mother, single mother with a little boy. And I think every adult has seen this where the little boy is looking for a father figure. If he's not there, he will latch on to an uncle or God willing, there's a grandfather there. He's looking for someone, little boys and then even teenagers. Boys need a father in order to, to develop. And you also see this, you know, children of divorce sometimes, when it occurs in your early teen years or uh, late, uh, you know, eight, nine, ten, uh, there's often a frustration there, an anger, a deep-seated anger or frustration because of that, because the father isn't around. This is the natural development. Little boys need a father, little girls need a mother in order to teach them how to be men and women. And Christ was like us, is like us, in all things except sin. In all things. His human development, he is like us. We see this at the end of the incident of the finding of, of our Lord in the temple. St. Luke says he grew in strength and wisdom before God and men. This is what he's referring to, that human development. And Christ then needed a father, a father figure. Now, of course, in his divinity, he didn't need that. Christ is true God and true man. In his divinity, of course, he knew everything. He created uh, human fatherhood and the family. And so he didn't need it in his, human, in his divine nature. But in his human nature, he chose to be like us in all things except sin. Therefore, in his human nature, Christ chose then to have a father, to have a father who would be the model of manhood for him. And when we really meditate on this, then we begin to realize the great spiritual state that St. Joseph was the great, you know, he would have had to have been created to have this position and chosen special not as elevated as Our Lady, because she is without sin, immaculately conceived. St. Joseph was conceived in an original sin, just like you and I. But his mission in life was far, far elevated. That he was to be the model of manhood for the Savior. And therefore, he would have developed his manhood before he got married, he would have been in that high spiritual state already. And when we reflect on this, then we realize the reason why St. Joseph then is probably the second greatest saint in heaven. Father Garagou Lagrange makes reference to that. Our Lady is the greatest saint and then St. Joseph because he's the one who taught our Lord how to be a man, how to sacrifice. And of course, it was integral to his mission. He was, he was a man, and that is part of you know, being a man, being able to sacrifice uh, for, for your family. Or as St. Paul, you know, we kinda, we're kind of going around in a circle. St. Paul then, when he talks about fatherhood, he refers to Christ's, Christ's sacrifice to make his church holy and pure. And he's using that as an example for fatherhood. But then we turn it around and we say, well, where did Christ in his humanity learn that? Learn that role, he learned it from St. Joseph. And so devotion to St. Joseph is a very important thing in these days. There was a true attack on the family and fatherhood also. 
And so St. Joseph is a good intercessor for all, for the church, for fatherhood and families. You know, when we think about what we have, what we know about him in the scriptures, what we have in the scriptures, and what we have in the scriptures, of course, is secondhand knowledge. Matthew, St. Matthew probably didn't know St. Joseph. St. Luke, we know, definitely didn't. Our Lady, uh, the pious tradition is Our Lady met with St. Luke, or I should say St. Luke met with Our Lady. And so he could have gotten some of his information about St. Joseph there. And then uh, St. Matthew would have been told about St. Joseph. But when we look at him in the scriptures, we find he doesn't say a word. He doesn't say anything. But we find him being a humble leader of his family. You know, initially when he sees, when he realizes Our Lady is with child, you know, it says he's a just man, therefore he wanted to put her away quietly. Now, many of the early saints and fathers of the church understood that properly. They understood that he didn't mean that he, the, that he believed she committed a sin. It meant that he recognized that she was on a different spiritual level than him and wanted to just put her away quietly. God will take care of you because he knew that she wouldn't have committed this sin. This is what the, many of the early saints talk about. A few of them uh, do say maybe he thought that she committed a sin, but the majority of them said no. He recognized that she, he recognized that she was in a greater spiritual state. And he was just going to put her away quietly because if he was a just man, he would have turned her over to be stoned. And that's not the case. But the angel then comes to him and says, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for what is conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. The angel corrects him, tells him what to do. And it's important to also understand Catholic teaching is, is that St. Joseph and Our Lady had a true marriage. They had basically a sacrament there. There was no physical relation. Nevertheless, they had a marriage, husband and wife. And we see this where the angel talks to him and says, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. So they had a true marriage. And then what happens? When he goes to, to uh, Bethlehem, this was his town, where he was from, his village. And of course, he wanted to do the best for his wife and this child, the father. We, call, we refer to him as the foster father. And he's knocking on doors. These aren't strangers. These are his relatives, his cousins, his family, his friends. And all of them turn him away. There's no room. No room in the inns, no room at people's houses. And then finally he does find uh, a place, whether it's suitable or not. In God's providence it is. The stable now in Bethlehem, it was a cave with a little structure in the front. You can go to it. There's still a little cave there in Bethlehem. And we don't even know who it was. You know, oftentimes in scripture they'll say who it was. We don't know whose, whose stable that was, but he provided for his family. He provided in a way that he probably didn't want. He wanted to find a better lodgings for his wife, for Our Lady, but God's providence chose otherwise. He was provided this stable. So oftentimes, the same thing happens in our life. We hope we want something better, but God will give us what we need. I shouldn't say better. God sometimes doesn't give us what we want. Let's put it that way. But he will give us what we need. He'll take care of us as long as we put him first. And then what happened after the Magi come, the circumcision, the presentation, uh, the, the, yeah, the circumcision, the presentation in the temple. Then the angel comes again and instructs him, flee, go to Egypt, because really the government, the king, 
Herod wants to put him to death, wants to put the child to death, and presumably, you know, the Holy Family might also be uh, put to death. The government was hostile, trying to kill them, and he fled to Egypt. And he remained in Egypt until, again, he had another dream that said, those who are seeking to kill the child are dead, now you can return. You know, oftentimes we think, well, why, doesn't, why didn't God just kill Herod right there and then save the whole problem? We can't ask why in terms of God. God protected them. And then when Joseph came back, said he found out that Herod's brother was on the throne there in the south, and so he decided to move to the north under Philip up to Nazareth. And so St. Joseph, although he's given uh, spiritual, supernatural uh, guidance on what to do, in this case, he's told to go back. You can go back. Those who seek the child's death have, uh, have died. He then uses his own reason. The angel doesn't tell him to go to Galilee. He decides on his own. It would be safer for us to even be up there in Galilee. And so we see St. Joseph in his role as a father and the, the leader of the Holy Family, both relies on supernatural grace and then also his own reasoning. And so for fathers here and all fathers should do the same thing. We have to put God first though. St. Joseph achieved that high level of spiritual life, achieved that high degree of sanctity. And then that gave him the ability through his union, through holiness, to then make the proper decisions and get the graces to be able to guide his family. And so it is for all of us, and this is just not for the fathers, but this is the basic rule for our life. I spoke about this a few weeks ago. So we have to strive to be holy, to be united to Christ, to be united to God. And then based upon that, as we get holier, then we become more open to graces and grace can come in and influence our life, even in ways that we don't, we don't really see. We don't get anything dramatic like an angel appearing to us or an angel appearing in dreams to us. But that doesn't mean that's the only way God can give us graces. Graces to protect us, to help us in the difficulties we face today. Because as time goes on, it's apparent that our society and our government is becoming more and more hostile to um, Christianity, to Catholicism, to the truth of Christ. And so we will need these, uh, we'll need grace to be able to uh, live the way we should here in this world. And just like God protected the Holy Family through the ministry of St. Joseph, so also he will protect us here. St. Joseph is the patron of the Universal Church. I mean, he's the protector of the Universal Church because in essence, Our Lady and the Child Jesus was the church in seed. They were the original seed, and so St. Joseph was their protector. God gave everything under St. Joseph's, uh, really, power, his oversight. So also Pope Pius IX, 151 years ago, declared St. Joseph then the protector, the patron of the universal church, that is the whole church, because he's just doing what God did 2,000 years ago. So here, during this year of St. Joseph, let us all pray for the intercession of St. Joseph that he would protect the church. That he would also protect and guide families. And that he would be a special intercessor for fathers. We need to pray for this. Because things are getting more difficult. But as things get more difficult, more graces will be given. God never asked the impossible. 
He will give the graces if we turn to him, if we are faithful to him, if we strive to be holy. So during this holy year, let us then pray for the intercession of St. Joseph for the church, the world, and of course our families and fathers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.